My name is Mary Beth Connolly. I'm the Vice Mayor of Falls Church, and as I just said, I am thrilled to see so many people here today. Uh, we've got a full program, and hopefully by the time you get out of here, your heads are going to be just crammed full of information and thoughts and ideas. Um, I'm going to turn the mic over to Lawrence Webb, our school board chair, and he's going to introduce some school board members. Good morning, everyone. Uh, first, I want to thank you all for coming out this morning. Uh, on this very critical project that has been going on for a few years now. I think we're finally getting to a point that we have some great information that we want to share with you all today. Um, first, let me introduce, and I've only seen one, uh, my Vice Chair, Phil Reidinger, who's here today. And as right now, that's all I see that's here. Uh, I hope that you all take the time to listen, ask questions, take notes, because we want to get your feedback on this project. Between the council and the school board, we put a lot of time into this, hearing different proposals, seeing multiple options of this particular project. And we've done some narrowing down thanks to a smaller group of, our, of both boards and the council. And we have some options that we're gonna present to you all that you see these boards and graphs around the room. Hopefully that you all get a good idea of what we're looking to do. This project is going to cost us, but with your help, we hope that we get to a point of finding what's going to be the most affordable to the city, what's going to give us a 21st century high school project and program that we all are looking for as our students continue through the program here in Falls Church. Um, looking forward to hearing from you all today. Um, as you hear the presentations today, you're going to hear a little bit about potential changes to school program that may make some adjustments to the price. We're going to, as a board, have a conversation about that on Tuesday. If you want to join us and hear a little bit more about that potential that we're looking at, uh, please join us on Tuesday night at 7 for our work session on the budget. And we look forward to your comments and feedback today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good morning. I'm uh, David Tarter, the Mayor of Falls Church, and I am delighted to be here with you this morning. And uh, it's great to see so many people here. Um, before I get started, I'd also like to acknowledge a few of my colleagues. Uh, Vice Mayor Connolly, as you heard from earlier today. Uh, Dave Snyder on City Council. Uh, Letty Hardy is here somewhere. Letty, where are you? Raise your hand. Uh, Karen Oliver is here as well in the very back. And Dan Z, I think, is also here. Dan, where are you? There he is. Um, Phil Duncan uh, would like to be here. He's got some pressing family members, uh, family uh, matters in Tennessee. So uh, he sends his regards and uh, his regrets. Um, as you heard, this is a really exciting day for the city. We are on the cusp of some really important decisions that will affect our community for generations. And um, a lot of hard work has gotten us to where we are today. The working group has done a great job. Um, and in the past weeks putting this together, staff has done an incredible job. And if you could, please raise your hand if you helped work put this together because so many people have done so much hard work. If you could give them a round of applause. I, I understand staff was working last night till almost midnight. So uh, it's been a great, great uh, effort. Um, as you know, the school system is a cornerstone of our community. We have one of the greatest school systems in the United States. Uh, but we can't rest on our laurels. We have to keep uh, maintaining and enhancing our leadership position. And so that's why this project is so important. It's complicated though, and it's also expensive. We spent a whole lot of time working on this, and I know it's been frustrating um, to many the past process that we've gone through because it hasn't been as public as many of us would like to have, it, to have been. Uh, but that's changed. This is now, we're fully engaged with the community. We're having meetings like this to get your input. And it's critical because you are ultimately the decision makers uh, for this project. This will go to referendum and you all, the community, will make the decision. So it's really important that you're here today and we're delighted to hear your input and, and to hear the great ideas that you all have. And again, I want to just thank you all for coming out. So we appreciate and look forward to hearing what you have to say. Thank you. Okay. And I want to acknowledge that John Lawrence, a school board member, has just joined us this morning as well. And now, Russ Bodiska is here. He's the chair of the Planning Commission, and he's going to say something as well. Thank you. I also want to uh, 
welcome everyone here and uh, introduce some of the planning commissioners that are here in attendance. Uh, if you could stand up, I think there are four others. Uh, there's Kwafu Dijon, Melissa Teets, Lindy Hockenberry, and Tim Stevens in the back. Uh, and also we had uh, two members who were not able to attend due to pressing matters. Uh, the Planning Commission is just getting started in this process. Uh, our role in this will be to ultimately zone this property. Uh, right now it's just zoned residential and based on the input that we received today and throughout several hearings that we're going to hold as a Planning Commission, it's going to guide us into how we pursue designing this space. It could remain something simple with just a school, as you'll hear, or something that has uh, a huge change to the zoning that allows for commercial development. So uh, we're here today to listen. i um, excited that this process is getting going and that the Planning Commission is now uh, more formally involved, now that it's become a much more open process, and to hear your opinions to uh, guide us on how we should proceed. So uh, if you have any questions, uh, we'll be, the Planning Commissioners will be moving around a bit uh, from table to table to hear what uh, you have to say and uh, ask, ask us and uh, we'll try to get you an answer if there is something that uh, you haven't received from the people who are going to be guiding you at the tables. So I just want to welcome you and uh, look forward to seeing many, uh, many of you at our Planning Commission hearings as we go throughout the year. So thank you very much. I'm feeling short, so I'm going to stand up here. <laughs> All right, so there are a few housekeeping matters I want to make sure we're covering. The bathrooms. There are two bathrooms right through those doors. There's also a set of bathrooms at the very front of the school where you came in. Those are nice big bathrooms up there. Feel free to go whenever you have to. There's coffee and snacks over here. There's also tea, uh, so help yourself to that throughout the morning. And I just want to make sure everybody signed in and provided an email address so that we can keep you updated about what's happening in the future. Here's our schedule. So we're already a little bit behind, but from 9 to 10 for the first hour, Dr. Schiller and Wyatt Shields and I are going to make some presentations about what the school board and city council have been learning for the last many years, but especially the last six months, so that we can bring everybody up to speed. And I know in the room there are probably people that have been following this process really closely, and others who haven't. So we're gonna to try to get everybody up to the same page. Then for the next hour and 15 minutes, you're gonna stay at your tables and facilitators are gonna come around and talk to you and you're gonna have a chance to weigh in on each of the options that we have and uh, give your opinions. And then, then we're gonna wrap up and answer any other additional questions. Hopefully we're gonna be done by 11.30. So talk fast, everybody. All right. So this is the piece of land we're sitting on the George Mason and Mary Ellen Henderson campus. And I'm gonna look back first, just to give you a little bit of history of how we got here. So prior to 2013, uh, in the early 2000s, there had been a conversation about what are we gonna do about George Mason? It's going, we need to do something about George Mason. And we own the land where we're sitting today, but it was not in the city of Falls Church. I bet there's some people here that didn't know that. So we owned it, but we couldn't zone it. When we built this high school, or this school in 2003, 2004, and five, we had to, um, Lauren, can you turn on the back ones? That's good, okay. Um, we had to work with uh, Fairfax County to get permission to build this building, and that was hard. And how many people paid attention to our Mount Daniel process last year? That was hard too. So we knew that if we wanted to put a high school on this property when it was in Fairfax County, it was gonna be really hard. So. I want to shout out to the school board and city council members who were on in two, 2012 and 2013 who worked, did yeoman's work with Fairfax County uh, to get this land into Falls Church. We sold our water system to Fairfax County water and this land became ours and now we could do whatever we want on it. So that's kind of where we are. In November 13 there was a referendum agreeing to the water sale. How many people voted in that referendum? A lot of people in the room. Um, and Falls Church became both the owners and the zoners of this parcel of land. And then there, suddenly there was a path forward because as part of that agreement, we were able to take 10 acres and put commercial development on there. And as has been said before, it's a really expensive process. So there was a thought in the community that if we could use that land, put commercial development on it, it would balance out the expense of building a new high school. Um, so since then, we've had a series of steps on that path, and it has not been a straight path, as you know. It kind of reminds me of the children's book, Harold and the Purple Crayon. 
Uh, we're going in a lot of directions, and we're drawing the path as we go. So every step we take, no one's saying, all right, this is the next step. Great, good job, you're good. We're all kind of making it up as we go along, just like Carol. But hopefully in the end, we're going to have something that we've drawn that we can all be really proud of. Uh, and the school board and city council have been thinking about every possible option because we know that we need 21st century schools that have a capacity to educate our growing population, and we need to do it in a way that is affordable to all of our taxpayers. It's been a continuing process, and a lot of people have participated. So back in the early 2000s, there was a facilities committee. Who here was on that facilities committee? Melissa, Dave, Debbie. That was in the early 2000s, and there were binders and binders and binders of information about what to do with the facilities in Falls Church. How about in October of 2014, the Urban Land Institute came in and did a technical assistance panel. Who was here for that one? Some people were here for that one too. And they looked at this piece of land, and that's kind of a drawing of it, and they said, yeah, you could put commercial development on the front, and you could put schools in the back, and there's a lot of possibility here, but there's a lot of challenges too. How about in June 2015, we had a community vision meeting in this room about what people wanted to see on this campus. Who was here for that one? So this is a lot of time that you've spent sitting on those stools. My husband said to me this morning, I'm sorry, I can't come. I can't sit on those stools again. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I appreciate all of you who have been here for all of this. Uh, how about in October 2015, we did the School of the Future, and we talked about environmental concerns, and we built with Legos and drew pictures of what we wanted to see. Who was here for that one? All right. And I, what I want to assure you, and I've heard people say this, all the work that was done in those previous meetings still exists. It ha it's not gone. You haven't wasted your time giving input there because it's all informing where we are right now. And hopefully today's meeting is going to give us a great summation of that and help us be able to move forward and get working on our high school. So last summer the City Council and School Board uh, was involved in a PPEA process to see what we could do with the land and we decided that that wasn't working for us and we canceled that process because we had to take a deeper look at all the possibilities. So we hired Link Strategic Partners to help us move along this path and they have helped us really build the path so like Her with Harold and the Purple Crayon we're able to do this. So we left no stone unturned and I have some examples of some of those stones. This one is the renovation stone. We took a good hard look at that. And here's the affordability stone. We took a really hard look at that. Enrollment projections, that was another big concern of people. How big of a high school do we need to build? This one is the unexpected. We looked at a lot of things and said, oh, we have no idea what's gonna happen here. So we realized that we had to have a little tolerance for risk and what could be unexpected. This one, which is actually Tinner Hill Granite, is the history stone. We looked at the history of how we got here and what we want for this community and what the people who founded Falls Church want and what we value in this community. This is the time frame. We looked at how long it would take and what that would mean to the school program. And this one says the build new option. And then we also looked at a renovation option and an addition option. And you're going to hear a lot about those today. So, in this notebook, here's the giant notebook of options that the school board and city council and staff have been looking at for the last six months. And lucky for you, we've done the work so you don't have to because it's really dense. Uh, the, the poster behind Wyatt and Dr. Schiller there lists the 13 options that we looked at and we've really sifted through those and we're, anybody here is happy to talk to you about all those different options, but we thought today for, we would, couldn't go through all 13, so we've narrowed it down to three that are really symbolic of the different things that we've talked about. And I have to say, none of them is perfect. All of them have positives and negatives. There's risk on all of them, but we got to pick one, so that's why we're here today, to find out what it is that the community really would like to do. So my last thing is to talk about enrollment projections. And there's always been a lot of questions about how big of a school do we really need. So FCCPS works with Weldon Cooper Center, which is out of UVA, and they are the, do a lot of the demography for the state of Virginia. And every year they give us school enrollment projections for the next 15 years. They use past growth, birth rates, and local trends. And because the numbers are predictions, they're never perfect. So it's hard to look at those and say, yep, we need a school for 1,324 students in this year exactly. Because 
That's not how it works, right? Um, but when we took a look at the projections over the last 10 years and over the last five years, we saw that in the past 10 years, their projections are within 1.28% of what we actually got. And in the last five years, they're within 1.81% of what we actually got. So we decided we could look at those Weldon Cooper numbers and they were valid enough. And I'm sure that there are people in here that don't agree with me on that one. And you can certainly have a conversation with someone about that on the side at some point. But we know that it's not perfect because they're projections. Um, so we're never going to have any exact certainty on what's coming. But the Weldon Cooper numbers told us that we need to plan for a 1,200 to 1,500 student school at George Mason. It's predicted to reach 1,200 students by 2029 and 1,350 by 2033. But we don't know what's going to happen next. World events, um, the economy, anything. So we're assuming that a 1,200 to 1,500 student school is what we're going to work with. And now I'm going to turn the microphone over to Dr. Schiller, and he's going to take you to the next part. You want to you want to hold it, or do you want to? Okay. Well, good morning, everyone. Thanks for coming out. It has been certainly an honor and a pleasure for me to serve Falls Church City since November and to live in this city. It is a remarkable little city. It truly is. I'm very impressed with the incredible talent and commitment of the faculty, the support staff that you have in the school district. I'm also very, very impressed by the incredible kinds of students that we have coming to our schools every day. If you think about it for a moment, Thackeray Preschool is a remarkable facility serving our youngest children. The only limitation that we have there is its size because of the fact that so many more children would love to take advantage of that. But if you have not visited that school to see that warm, caring environment, please do so. It'll warm your heart. October 2018, Mount Daniel, the new facility, is scheduled to open thanks to your support. It's going to be an environment that's going to be able to be wonderful as a great learning opportunity and a place to teach our youngest children who are attending kindergarten, first and second grade. Thomas Jefferson. Another wonderful facility and environment that supports the learning and the teaching. The other night I was over at the STEAM night to see all the children there and the staff and all the many volunteers and the proud parents. It just warms your heart. I wish it was that way all over the nation. In this little city, you have something that others dream about but do not have every day. Look around here, look at this facility. What a place to learn, what a place to work and teach. Airy, open, marvelously maintained. You know, the program, your staff, the high performance of the students throughout this district, in the six decades that I have been in this business around the nation, leading school districts, leading states, I have never come across environment like Falls Church City and its commitment to education anywhere. You have a district of which should be extremely proud and should celebrate that every day. Look at our high school, one of the highest performing high schools in the nation. Incredibly talented children coming to our schools. What a staff. Combined, it gives you something to realize of what more it could be. But sadly, our high school facility does not provide the environment that our students or staff deserve. It simply does not. The faculty serve in a great capacity. The facility cannot serve adequately the projected enrollment, nor allow the program to grow. That's why we're here today, folks. The elected leaders of Falls Church City, the city council, and the school board, and you as residents need to address and decide upon a pathway to address the needs of the high school facility. And the leaders in the citizenry in the very near future have some very difficult and hard decisions to make so we can move forward with a solution for that facility.
Doing nothing, maintaining the status quo, is not an option. It is not a solution. <clears throat> that is something we, that we need to keep in mind. You know, we all know that George Mason has a superb program, tremendous staff, great student body. And we also know throughout the nation, the high school in all the districts serve as the flagship. Sadly, this current facility, which has served nobly for 65 years, cannot continue to do so as it stands today. Why not a high school facility, a flagship facility that befits the program, that provides the environment for sustained excellence and growth supporting its students and staff? Why not? Now, the facility that we're going to be talking about today, the three main options, will all evolve into a total of about 300,000 square feet. One option, by minimally renovating the current 200,000 square feet and adding a new addition of 100,000 square feet, will give us, of course, a new 300,000 facility. Partially, two-thirds of it will not be new, but it will be minimally renovated. The other two options we'll be talking about today will be 300,000 square feet of new facility. The new, two of the options for the 300,000 new square feet will be roughly divided into a third for academic space, a third of it for support areas, and a third of it for physical education and athletic areas. That is the constant that we're working with that grows out of the visioning. Vice Mayor indicated that we're projecting a student body of 1,200, which may grow to 1,500. The general area will support 1,500 students, the cafeteria, the auditorium, and all the other areas. The classroom space will support 1,200 students as we now schedule with one teacher per classroom. Should the enrollment move from 1,200 and edge closer to 1,500, a change of the scheduling of teachers to their own room, single room use, would need to be changed. But we need to make that point clear, is the fact that we enjoy one classroom per teacher and it helps with the delivery of the program. All right. Some of you have questioned, and all of us questioned, the need for doing something. I'd like to talk a little bit about what the facility is like today. I'm sure many of you have been there. you visited. If you'd like to see it again, please give me a call. We'll walk through it, through my, and I'll show you the school through my eyes. Yesterday, I dragged two city council members and a board member for three hours through the school so we can take a hard, hard look at what it is. We can show it. I could talk to you about it. We can show you. But sometimes pictures will tell a story. And I think that's what we're going to have to take a look at. Here's our robotics lab, ladies and gentlemen. I took this picture the other day when I was visiting the students and the teachers. It's a converted wood shop. Number one robotics program and through its competition in the state of Virginia. A couple weeks ago, several board members and city council members and I took a tour to Thomas Jefferson High School. Have you ever been there? Seen there? We sent our students there. Their program is not as good as the one as George Mason. But look at that facility. If you flash back to what we have, it's remarkable what our students are able to get accomplished. It's largely because of their talent and the incredible leadership of their teacher. I don't need to show you any other pictures, but I will tell you a little bit about the school. It's a facility whose infrastructure needs are significantly and far more costly that are necessary beyond minimal renovations in order for it to last permanently for another 50 years. It is not energy efficient. It, the wiring, the plumbing, the windows, the doors need replacement. The hallways are narrow and cannot accommodate increased enrollments to 1,200, 1,500 students. The lighting is insufficient. The low ceilings create a very uncomfortable environment. 
It's not effective to have a building like that. The current facility does not adequately support the current academic program. We are using substandard areas to teach our students. Areas that have been converted that were never intended to be classrooms. It certainly, even with the addition, we would not be able to accommodate the kind of growth of population throughout the day in the hallways. If you take a run from one end of the building where you might be taking your band, your orchestra class, and you take a run to the other area of the building where real science labs are, which are woefully outdated. Imagine eight, nine, hundred students, a thousand <coughs> students trying to make that. As it was added on and expanded, the footprint sprawled. Students have five minutes to get between classes. I'm old. I can't make it in five minutes. We were walking through there yesterday without students in the halls because of the exam schedule being completed. Go there when school is in session. You know, we maintain the status quo and or do the minimum renovations we'll talk about, it, which are quite needed. It will invite systems failure over the next 20, 25, 30, 35, 40 years. Keep that in mind. All right, let's, let's talk about now moving ahead. I'd like to ask you to think about these three questions as we go forward this morning. First question I'd have to ask you to think about is, what is needed to sustain and support and improve George Mason as an excellent, high-performing school in the future and whose current enrollment is projected to increase by a third or more? What is needed? The second question, do the options that we are providing you today, and they have been exhausted, and we've distilled them down to three options. If you choose to do so, and select one of these options, some of them, two of them, provide an opportunity for economic development on some of the acreage fronting Haycock Road, Route 7, UVA, and UN, Virginia Tech Center. The economic development opportunity is enormous. And the other question to ask yourself is how does each of these options financially impact the city of Falls Church, its residents, and businesses for the next 30 years? Mr. Shields is going to walk us through on those. But now let's turn our attention to the options, shall we? Once again, they're based on the work that's preceded today. It's nothing new in that respect. Option number one is taking the 200,000 square foot school that we know today and doing minimal renovations. You'll ask yourself, well, why not do lots of re renovations? You can see it in the boards. They cost then almost as much as a new school. We would also add the 100,000 school addition in close proximity. We will show you later possible places to expand the campus. Second option for your consideration is building a 300,000 square foot new facility. And there are some options of where it could be. But they're limited because if indeed you move into two phases, complete the first phase of construction by 2021, students can move in. complete the second phase of construction to have now a new facility so students can move in in 2028. Two phases, the end result, brand new 300,000 square foot facility of which you can be proud. Or build 300,000 square feet, brand new, and in 2021, move into it. And at that time, you have up to 10 acres of economic development opportunity available, which Mr. Novotny will speak to. Those are the three options. Georgetown University points out in a recent research study that having an environment that will support student learning and teaching 
has shown an 11% increase in student achievement. You ask yourself, how much higher can our students attain? How much higher can their student achievement rise? Think about the possibilities. Okay, let's move on a little bit. Let's talk about these in detail. Renovation in addition has a $65 million approximate, a bit of a range on either side, keep that in mind. The financial modeling tells us it may cost us $65 million as a cost estimate for the minimal renovation of the existing building, adding 100,000 square feet, and at the end, a 303,000 square foot school facility. That's your time frame. Today's fifth graders will enter the renovated school. It has no economic development opportunity, as the maps will show you, for that option. <coughs> now let's look at this. What's outlined in red are potential areas in closest proximity to the high school to put your addition. And as you can see, there are other options. We are not trying to say, this is what's been decided. These are just options. Someone might argue to put it closer to uh, Virginia Tech and University of Virginia. That's not what we're here about today. It's here to understand where and how we would move forward. Your core facility of George Mason, built in 1953. There were additions added on. And you can see how it expanded. <coughs> and how the footprint has now sprawled. Okay, let us, let's move on. Phase two. A two-phase construction. Option two, I should say. It's two-phase construction. New facility, phased over time. Phase one, we estimated, would cost $64 million to complete. Where would we go first? We need to take down and create a new environment for our Science labs, our arts program, the STEAM program, ladies and gentlemen, the STEM program, and the auditorium. Once that is completed, we would demolish that area, which we have now replaced with new facility. And the opportunity for you would be to have four acres of commercial development available. Again, when would this happen for the fifth graders? They would enter ninth grade when phase one is complete. That gives you a little perspective. The second phase, now this whole budget that we see here is approximately 147 million. Phase two is going to cost 83 million. It'll be completed in 2028. So now imagine the rest of the new facility is constructed, demolished, proud old lady that we now know as George Mason, and we now open up a whole new George Mason High School. Today's preschoolers, class of 2033, will enter the complete school. Anyone have children who would be of the class of 2033? There you are. You want to wait that long? Every student in the system today in Falls Church City under phase one and two, will experience high school construction activity taking place while they are attending this school and that school. I need not tell you what it's like to be in a construction zone. One of the things we learned about going to Thomas Jefferson High School a couple of weeks ago, and again, I thank city council members and, and members of the board and my staff who were there. They've been at this of renovation for seven years. It'll finally open in April, completely finished with the construction. Seven years of an experience, right outside classrooms that are being renovated, new addition putting on. You know what that means for, for kids, for learning, for the entire environment. The potential is that we need to, if we're gonna go in two phases, construct the, first, the facility, the first phase, in proximity to the high school. So, the area that's in red, that'll be coming up on the next slide, that's what we talked about. That's the auditorium, that's your visual performing arts area, that would be demolished. And that is what would be recreated in phase one. 
And I would mind you that during that construction period, there will be impact on the students and on in both the middle school and George Mason while that's taking place. We know that. That opens up site one, site two for commercial development, which Mr. Uh, Shields will be speaking about. Okay, let's go to the single phase. 2021, we've outlined here potential areas for where the school could be located. There are a lot of options. <clears throat> Wrapping around here, but there's a whole area that we would identify as a potential phase for a new high school for phase one and phase two. Okay, once the new high school is built, then what we have now existing in red would be demolished, which opens up additional commercial development opportunities or other opportunities that the Planning Commission and City Council would deem appropriate. You know, I was gonna talk about the impact on the educational program. I'll probably bore you with it. I'm not going to do that right now. You know education, you know what the impact is on construction. What I'm concerned about for the future and for whoever will come in here to be your permanent superintendent in the next couple of months is that the best learning environment, the highest quality program, and the best staff that money can bring in and support are offering the best program to our students. Falls Church is a superb school system. Your decisions down the road are going to mark in terms of your commitment to education as well as your commitment to children and provide that pathway for the future of this city. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, we'll do it one more time. The new high school in one phase. All right, here we go. There's an entire area that the architects and the engineers and the designers can take a look at of where the best placement would be for the school. We are not sitting in a back room somewhere and designing a school and what it would look like or where it would be placed. That's beyond our capability. But the important piece is that there's flexibility with a new construction. It also opens up this area for potential planning for commercial development if you choose to go that direction. The opportunities are boundless. But if your imagination is such that you can see a new high school, your flagship, located somewhere there in a repositioning and repurposing and a reorganization of the recreational and physical education and athletic fields. Those have to go hand in hand. Okay, let's talk about. Oh, yep. We're going to go on to affordability. The affordability. I'll give you a hug. All right. I just got. I just heard two questions from the audience that people write over to me, and I just want to emphasize that um, the high, the new, or the phased high school or the new high school that we're talking about, it's not going to be a one-story school. One of our previous. Uh, visioning sessions, the footprint has to be collapsed and it's going to be a four to six story high school. So just so people, I want to make sure everybody understands that, that we're not going to have a big spread out school. It's going to be taller than this school, four to six stories. And then the second thing I want to just emphasize is that none of these options have been selected yet. The School Board and City Council is still really digging into all of them. And this is your opportunity to provide us with some input so that as we go forward, we'll be able to make an informed decision. <coughs> but everything is still on the table. Good morning, everybody. My name is Wyatt Shields. I'm the city manager, and it's a pleasure to be with you this morning. We're, we'll talk about um, what this costs and, and explore the affordability question for the city. Um, also, when we're talking about the economic, economic development options, I'm going to be followed by the chairman of the EDA, Mike Novotny, who will talk a little bit more about economic development. What kind, how much, what does it mean? And, uh, and, and engage on that issue. And you'll have a, a chance to talk about that in your breakout sessions as well. And our, almost our entire planning department is here today, and it's great that they're here so they can hear your input on these issues also. 
because ultimately they, they will be um, working with the Planning Commission to, to help shape a vision uh, for, for, uh, for this campus. Um, there's a lot on this slide. When we talk about affordability, there are a lot of things we need to consider. One, we're talking about the school project right now, but that's not the only thing in the CIP. We have a city to run as well with transportation needs, with uh, public safety needs, uh, with library needs, and those types of things. Every decision that the city council makes in meeting these capital needs, though, they are going to make with an eye towards the long-term sustainability of the city. Uh, we are not going to put ourselves in a position where we harm the future uh, financial viability of the city. So all these things weigh into that. What it comes down to is what the taxpayers think is reasonable and what we think is a, legal, a reasonable <coughs> level of risk in terms of how we engage in moving forward with these options. There's really two kind of big main bottom lines though. Uh, we're not going to get a high school for free, um, even with economic development. And two, when, we're, when we explore this question of affordability, because there are so many factors, some of which are beyond our control, it is a complicated issue. But let's take a look, um, just step back a little bit so everybody's grounded in some of the financial facts of the city. We currently have just under uh, $52 million of debt on our books. 75% of that is invested in our school facilities, about a quarter of that is invested in our general government facilities. What that costs us today to service is $6.2 million, or about 16 cents on your real estate property tax bill. So that's where we are today. Um, in terms of the overall five-year capital improvements program, what we have identified in that five-year plan are some other capital needs, and they total up to be $143 million. And the adopted CIP, uh, the high school project is $112 million. What you'll see in our options is a number of 117 million, and that just reflects inflation and um, a bit more granular approach on what the cost of that project is. So 117 million for the build new option is what we're working with today. I'm gonna walk you through a couple of metrics that the industry will use in, a, in assessing the city's credit worthiness. And, um, and those relate to debt to assess value, debt service as a proportion of your overall budget, and debt per capita. So let's take a look at those against a couple of our peer uh, localities in Northern Virginia. So I have the city compared against jurisdictions ranging from Percival uh, to Fairfax County. And they're really ranked in terms of the size of those jurisdictions. And amongst all these jurisdictions, uh, Falls Church is um, really closer to Manassas Park and Percival. We're among the smallest of all those jurisdictions. <coughs> but the average, as you can see, in terms of this metric of debt to assess value, in other words, how much debt we have relative to the value of all the real estate in the city, uh, we're uh, slightly uh, below average on that. So we have uh, a pretty healthy uh, debt capacity or capacity for new debt going forward relative to our peers. However, if we implement the full adopted capital improvements program, we will be um, above average amongst all of our peers in terms of debt to assess value. In terms of how much your, of your debt service relative to your overall budget, currently um, just under 8% of our budget goes to debt service. That's below average for the region. If we had to implement the full CIP, we'll be significantly above average for the region over fi uh, about 15% of our budget will go to service our debt. And then debt per capita, uh, the rating agencies, investors like to look at this just in terms of our ability to pay. Um, currently, we're just under the regional average in terms of uh, about $4,000 of debt for every man, woman, and child in the jurisdiction. That's pretty normal for our area. If we implement the full CIP, however, uh, will be significantly above uh, averages and norms uh, in terms of a debt per capita. Uh, debt per capita. And so these are reasons why we've been going very deliberatively through this process because we recognize this is a big project and it does entail some, some uh, risk. So again, these are the three options that Bob just walked us through. Uh, the renovation in addition, the build new in two phases or the build new in one phase. So let's look at those from a financing perspective. 
These are the costs that Bob just walked us through. So renovation in addition is 65 million. It'd be completed in 2021. It has no commercial development and it has no uh, potential spinoff from uh, either a land sale, transaction, or future tax yield from commercial development. So that's, your, uh, that's option one as we've modeled it and, and as we're looking at it. Then you have the build new in two phases, which is between these two lines. So you have phase one and you have phase two and then you have the total. And this, this two phase, what it is really about is trying to de-risk it from a financial perspective. That's the reason we're exploring this option. On the other hand, however, it introduces new operational risks and operational difficulties. So that's sort of the balancing act that we'll have to uh, consider as we think about this two-phase option. But what it does is uh, opens up in phase one or after phase one is complete, uh, potentially more or less four acres of land there on the Haycock Road frontage most likely. Um, the value of that in terms of a sale or lease price uh, would be between 14 and 18 million dollars and the tax yield on that could be as we've modeled it with, uh, with uh, densities that are pretty similar to what you see for the new construction along Broad Street of about uh, two million dollars for the full acre once it's built out. And we've modeled that as having a five-year lag behind an actual sale transaction. We've modeled that for all the economic development options. So the bottom line is uh, you can have about three million dollars of tax yield off of about six acres of economic development um, along with uh, the transactional benefits for the, from the sale or lease of land that would help offset this cost. And the virtue of this one really is that you get some of that economic development working for you before you've incurred the full project cost. Now what's most efficient from a school operations perspective would be the build new in one phase. Um, it has the highest upfront <coughs> cost, however. Currently modeled at 117 million. That could bring potentially eight to 10 acres of land forward for economic development, generating between 30 and $42 million in terms of transaction value uh, through a sale or a lease, and then a tax yield between four and $5 million per year. So those are the numbers that we're using for modeling. Uh, they are uh, backed up by outside expert review. We've been looking at this for a period of time. We think these are reasonable modeling expectations. But one of the key things is that the annual tax year, which we're modeling five years after completion, that's not guaranteed. It's going to be a third party that will have to perform and have to develop this land. We can't control that. We can't force it to happen. Um, and then importantly, none of our modeling deals with operating budgets. This is strictly capital costs that we're looking at here, just so we all understand that. So from a financial perspective, the renovation and addition summary it has the lowest direct cost at 65 million. It has higher annual maintenance costs because we'll be taking care of an older building in perpetuity. Uh, and there's no land sale or economic development associated with it. So as, as a, just getting back to this, when you, when you look at this, it ends up being um, as expensive to the taxpayer or potentially more expensive to the taxpayer, even though it has the lowest direct cost um, if you factor in the economic development piece. And so here are those numbers. If you uh, finance the 65 million with 30 year debt, which is what we're modeling for all of these school um, options at 4% interest, then that's a $3.7 million annual debt service or nine and a quarter cents on your real estate tax rate. For the average homeowner in the city, which is a $700,000 home, that would be $650 per year that would uh, be added to your tax bill to finance that. Um, we do have $9 million in reserves today that are really designated or envisioned to be used for this capital project. So uh, that $9 million could be used to help reduce this cost. All right, so let's look at the two-phase option. This is the highest cost option, but it spreads those costs out over eight years. It pushes half the cost out. It does lower financial risk as we're seeing it by taking it in those two chunks and allowing us to see how the economic development performs before we take on the full freight of the project. And we do have 
modeled in increased costs for the second phase just to account for inflation. Um, so in terms of the numbers of how that works out in phase one, just going through the same analysis that we did before, that's a very similar number than we just saw for renovations, so the same cost, $650 per household. We would use the $9 million to help bridge over that period between taking on the liability for the school construction costs and before the economic development comes online. What we could have uh, with economic development as a potential reduction from this $650 down to $325 to $216 per average household. And this is a partial illustration of why economic development is being considered for this site because it could have a very powerful influence in terms of this affordability question with all the caveats that I've already noted. And then phase two comes online in 2026. That essentially doubles all the costs. So you add an additional uh, nine point uh, nine and a quarter cents for a total of an eighteen and a half cent exposure to the taxpayer, thirteen hundred dollars per household in today's dollars, and with the additional land up to a total of six acres of economic development, this number could be reduced down to about six hundred and fifty to four hundred and fifty dollars per household if that economic development works out as we are modeling. <coughs> So then here is the, the third option, which is the one phase, build new. It delivers the high school most rapidly. This option has the highest upfront cost of 117 million, and we do carry the risk of the land sale or the economic development not occurring along the timeline that we're planning. That's the principal risk. If we take this land to market, most of the experts tell us it has value and it ultimately will perform for the city. What you really have is timing risk. You could try to go to market at a time when the market is not great, in which case you have to ride that out if you're gonna maximize your value. But here's how those numbers work. 117 million to finance would be 6.9 million in annual debt service. That comes to, for the, your average homeowner, for a owner of a $700,000 home, to $1,200 uh, on your tax bill. We'd use the $9 million in reserves again to help bridge over the period until the economic development comes online. And with the assumptions we have for the economic development, there's a potential reduction of that $1,200 cost down to $600 to $400 per average household. So that's a summary of, uh, of these options from a, from a financial perspective. All of them we just need to be very mindful of and kind of keep in there, it's the big picture. That with those economic and with all of these assumptions, uh, things can change. Um, there is interest rate risk, uh, there's market risk for the sale proceeds. For all of these, we've modeled the sale at about four million uh, per acre as a, as a yield, um, and then um, uh, we uh, discounted that a little bit just to be um, to give ourselves a little bit of cushion. There's a potential for a credit downgrade. We're a small city. If we go to the market asking for $117 million of bonds, we're currently AAA rated for two of the rating agencies and one notch below by, uh, by Moody's. It is likely for a bond sale of that size, we'll be taking down a notch or two. That will make the, uh, the cost of, of the loan higher. For any big project, there's cost control risk. I think we have a track record of managing those well. Uh, but that's a risk. And then there's the fact that this is not the only project in the CIP and we have other needs out in the city. So there are ways we can mitigate some of those risks. One of the key ones that the investors want us to do more than anything else is make sure we have very healthy reserves so that if plans don't work out, we've got a shock absorber for that. Uh, currently our unassigned fund balance is about 17% of our annual expenditures probably need to increase that, get it up to about 20% at a minimum. But most importantly, we need a comprehensive plan of finance that deals with contingencies, that deals with things not working out as planned. Uh, what I can uh, promise you is that the city council is going to be very careful about this. They are not going to rashly go out into a plan of finance that will put the city's future at risk. And so as we go through these steps, we'll be looking at every step of the way to try to mitigate risks as we go as we go forward 
So with that, um, there will be a, t a chance for uh, uh, questions and answers as we go through the program. But right now, I'm going to turn it over to the, our chairman of the EDA, uh, Mike Novotny. And Mike Novotny has been watching this process for a very long period of time and also has been very helpful with us in trying to help us kind of map out these options uh, graphically as well. Mike, thank you. Thank you, Mike. Um, and thanks for the opportunity to talk to you for a few minutes about um, the potential economic development on the site. Um, I plan to take about five to six more minutes, and then after that, I think that concludes the uh, presentation portions of the meeting. So, um, part of what you're uh, being asked this morning is if you if you want to see economic development on the school site, and it's it's quite frankly a very daunting question. I think um, I. I tried to break it down into maybe three kind of talking points or you know sub subsets that I'll try to tackle here over the next few minutes. Um, first, uh, what does economic development really mean for the school site itself? Uh, second, how much potential economic development are we really talking about? Um, and then third, what kind of economic development might we be able to attract at the school site? So on the on the first question of what it really means for the school site. I, I think of it in really uh, four buckets of uh, potential opportunities, um, you know, a couple of, of which Wyatt has talked to in his presentation. The first is the obvious selling or leasing a portion of the land. And you know, by, the, uh, by, his, by the city's estimates, um, you know, potentially 30 to $40 million. Um, the school estimates are upwards of $100 million. So it doesn't pay for the whole school, but it pays for a pretty good, pretty good portion of that. The, uh, the school site itself is 34 acres, so what we're talking about is up to 10 acres that could be available for that commercial development. Um, the second bucket is creating that new annual tax revenue. Quite frankly, that is the bigger of the two. The more obvious is you know, potentially selling the land because that's an early um, you know, transaction, but really it's over time creating that new annual tax revenue uh, that uh, would come into the city uh, proceeds on an ongoing basis, um, and that allows the city to pay for additional bonding for the new high school for other school projects perhaps TJ in the future future or other projects so uh, the third bucket I would suggest is really creating a great place in the western end of our city this is an opportunity I don't know if the city's ever really seen or, or potentially experienced uh, 10 acres right next to Metro you know we have two metro stations with their names on it but we really don't have a lot of land by the metro stations themselves uh, but this is really an opportunity, um, you know, to uh, to start from scratch and create a great place uh, within our city that I think all of us, if, if done well, would be very proud of, and I think we'd all enjoy it. Um, and then the fourth bucket I would throw out there too is just the opportunity to create a greater job base in the city. Something you know, we have a huge residential base. We don't have a, a good job base in the city um, that you know we could uh, we could try to bolster and bolster our commercial areas that currently exist as well through this. Uh, so the, the, next, the next question I will um, try to tackle is how much potential economic development are we really talking about? And um, you know, I won't reiterate the, you know, the 30 to 40, 40 million, but the, you know, let me skip to the, the new annual tax revenue at full build out of four to five million dollars um, annually. Uh, the city's school, uh, the city's total budget is $80 million. So if you added $5 million of new net revenue on an annual basis, that's really increasing your budget by 6%. Um, I think that could be conservative, quite frankly, depending on what kind of commercial development could come out of this. Um, and then when you when you put in the context of uh, bonding capability, you know you could bond potentially 50 to $80 million in in new bonds again for the new high school or other projects. And then there's additional spin-off economic activity that is really, um, it's hard to quantify, but it's the intangibles that we all know exist, right? The, um, you know, attracting people to come in and, and go to our restaurants, shop, and, and so forth, um, new employees that are doing the same, having lunch, having dinner in the city. Um, those are, you know, they're harder to quantify, so we don't put them in these numbers, uh, but they do exist. And, um, and then the last point here, that, that timing is critical to, uh, to understand uh, because of the nature of this, we do have to build the, the school facility first to free up the land for potential uh, commercial development. So in terms of what kind of um, development might we attract here on the site, um, there's, we believe there's at least four very viable commercial sites 
which could yield at least four buildings, perhaps more, depending on the sizing of the buildings. Um, I think at a minimum, you know, we could, uh, we could expect uh, heights and densities similar to what we already have seen in the newer developments along Broad Street, uh, seven floors plus or minus, uh, densities in the two and a half to three O FAR range. Um, there, you know, that could be conservative as well if the community wanted to see, to try to attract more development. Um, I, I think that's really a bigger discussion and perhaps one to uh, talk about today. Uh, but, um, you know, but, I, but I think as a baseline, you know, thinking about the newer development that we've seen so far is probably a good uh, comparable. Uh, I, I do think we should strive for a very strong mix of uses. Uh, retail, entertainment, hotel and conference space, um, office, housing, civic uses. Uh, this, is a, this is a lot of potential property to create a great place and you're going to need a different mix of uses to do that. You're going to want both daytime and nighttime traffic, you know, people that will support the restaurants and shops and uh, generally speaking create an active place. And, and I think having those significant retail and civic uses is going to be critically important to anchor the site and make it active, make it exciting, make it something that we all want to go down there and actually enjoy on a regular basis. Um, the, uh, the last uh, point I will leave you with is you know the potential for shared uses it's uh, I've heard comments in the past it's kind of a zero-sum game it's either the schools or commercial development I don't think that's really the case I think there's an opportunity to have some real synergy here and in sharing different uses across both the school the school portion as well as the commercial development portions of the site and you see some ideas listed here um, you know, for example, conference facilities built into a hotel that's also there, there and used by the schools for big events, whether it's science fairs or, or other large events. Um, shared parking facilities, right, that could be incorporated into the commercial development portion of the site shared by the schools. Um, central office space. Uh, Dr. Schiller um, had raised a, a great idea uh, recently about potentially, you know, could there be central, the central school office space? Does it have to be in the school or could it be part of a commercial development, perhaps some new office building that would incorporate that office space? Um, shared civic and school ice rink or pool facility. These are things that we don't have today. These are things that could add to the school program. We could have a school hockey team. Uh, we could have swimming competitions. And we won't, we won't get that, I don't think, without being able to do some shared use across these different areas of the site. You know, perhaps a shared library, shared plaza space. You know, there is a long list of potential items here that I think could overall make this a great space. So anyway, I will conclude here. I really appreciate the time. There's a lot to consider, and I, and I hope this is helpful for the uh, discussion to come. Thank you. Okay, I have never seen such an intent audience. <laughs> So I know you're absorbing all this. And I brought my friendly Rubik's Cube because that's what this reminds me of. You know, you get one side and you think I'm almost there and then you turn it a little bit and then you mess up the other side. And there's a lot of pieces that have to fall into place. And that's why it's so complex and that's why we're thinking really deeply about this. So here's what we're gonna do now. Because you guys have showed up more than we thought, we need to do a little adjustment on our next part. We're gonna take a 10 minute break. During that time, we're gonna kinda Pull the tables a little closer together in some parts. And Paul Stoddard, where are you, Paul? All right, Paul's gonna kind of coordinate this for us. Um, we're gonna ask you to, there are 16 facilitators in the room and they're gonna stand between two tables and wave one of our big signs. And we're gonna ask you to relocate so you're at one of those tables so you can be in that group. You're gonna stay in that group and then different facilitators are gonna to come to you and talk to you about each of these options. So we're gonna have a conversation about option one, the renovate and addition. We're gonna have a conversation about build in two phases and a conversation about build new. And then your fourth conversation is about economic development. There are, everybody got a little packet of cards and you're gonna be able to write comments on the cards as you go along. If you have a serious question for the whole group, there are purple cards on your table. If you wanna write a big, question that you have, write it on the purple card or bring it up to me and we'll try to answer that later on. Uh, and one thing I forgot to mention is we do have some newspaper reporters from the Mary Ellen Henderson paper here today that are reporting on us. So I just want to say hello and greet you. Ladies, thanks for being here. Hopefully you're going to get to attend this new school. I think that was it. So we've got a five, ten minute 
10 minute break while the facilitators set up the room. So uh, get up, stretch your legs, and come back and find a seat in the front of the room. Thank you. All right, does everybody have a seat and a facilitator? I see a couple people in the back still going to their seats. Uh, I'm going to roam around a little bit or whatever. So, are we ready? So we're going to have four 20-minute sessions. I'm going to be the timekeeper. I'm going to warn you at 17 minutes that it's time to wrap up. Your facilitators each have a topic. So a facilitator is going to come to you. The seat you're sitting in now is going to be your seat for the next hour and 20 minutes. I think that one of the one of the possible dangers or downsides of the two phase sort of ties off of your comment about this would be a very different yeah, venture. Right? Yeah. It seems like it's a very end next to I sixty six, it's a very appealing project inside the belt. There's a lot of interest in being out part of the city to work both the metro. All right, everybody, it's time to end the conversation. Stay in your seats unless you need coffee. And the facilitators are going to move to the next table. Okay, we are in breakout session number three. Does every group have a facilitator and every facilitator have a group? Sounds like that's a yes. It's time to switch, facilitators. I know you're great conversations, but you gotta move on so we can get out of here and talk for lunch. Facilitators, when you are done, take your notes and your paper and go out in the hallway here so you can have time to pull your thoughts together. So just take everything and go out in the hallway and everyone else stay where you're seated. Alright, I have some questions that people wrote down that we all found kind of interesting. We're not going to be able to answer every question, but here we go. Do we need the full development to get to get the revenue amounts in the current projections? So if there was a pool or an ice rink or shared parking in economic development, would we get the full economic development with the projections? The economic development projections, um, we can have a lot of sensitivity analysis. We've got great data on what the tax yield is by use. Uh, but we took a pretty simple approach in what we presented today, and we just used some round numbers. So for land transaction, uh, we modeled about $4 million per acre in terms of transaction benefit to the city. 
um, and we used $500,000 per acre in tax yield. Uh, so those are the assumptions that were built in and then we used some, some wiggle room to, to create some ranges. Any type of use that's not market driven like a pool or an ice rink or other amenities that might not generate the types of market rents, that would then change those calculations. And we can do all of that sensitivity analysis and we will be doing it as we, uh, as we move forward in this process. We've got a couple questions about parking. How would we park this new site if it's more compacted? And that's one of the things that has come up in every single conversation we have. We don't have the answer yet, but we've talked about share at working with our neighbors next door at UVA and Virginia Tech and Metro to share the empty parking that's over there or when the economic development is built to have them have parking for the school in some of the economic development. So I just will assure you that that is not a question we have ignored, but we don't have the exact answer yet. Here's one for Dr. Schiller. I read in the Falls Church News Press this week that there might be a way to reduce the cost of the build new option. Can you talk about that a little bit? <laughs> no. Uh, as Chairman uh, Lawrence Webb indicated, that we will be putting on the board agenda for discussion on Tuesday night uh, a look at the 300,000 square foot facility and what was also included in there with regard to a central office in addition to the 300,000 square feet and also in addition to this school for when it meets its enrollment uh, increase uh, around 2025. So the board is going to look at its options and discuss that, but those are things that if they were not included could reduce the overall cost uh, for a new high school, whether it be in one phase or two phases. Here's one for Mr. Shields. In your presentation, you mentioned a reduction in the amount of taxes people are being paid, and people seem to be con confused about what that means. Are they going to get a refund? Is the rate going to change over the years? Well, you can guarantee the rate's going to change over the years. <laughs> um, what we modeled, though, is um, if we're committed to the economic development, then we think it is possible to use our capital reserves in a way uh, to bridge to a period of time when the economic development will produce some yield to the city. So if that commitment is made, then we would recommend a, an initial increase in the taxes that we think will allow us uh, to bridge until the economic development comes online, plus the reserves, and then that should stay steady until such time as it either needs to be reduced uh, or increase because those assumptions either uh, play out correctly or they don't. That's the way it's, it's modeled. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions about it um, if there are any follow-up. If we did the minimal renovation addition option, how long would that last as a school building? The minimal renovations would be looking at replacing the roof, the HVAC system, the flooring and painting. That would be the facelift. We're not addressing any of the other issues in there. If we have that school renovated as discussed and it serves in perpetuity, you're now looking at what is the unknown. Once you start proceeding down the road 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, 50 years from now, what other costs, what would be determined through the construction? To what extent is it environmentally consistent with what the expectations are. You have a lot of unknown questions and unknown risks. Mr. Shields, this is for you. Do the costs of debt factor in the likelihood that our credit would be downgraded if we tried to take out a huge bond? Well, we, we just used a 4% interest rate assumption. That is a completely arguable assumption. Interest rates today are around uh, 3%. Um, so 4% um, is, is what we use. Um, if you go out further, I think probably there are market commentators who would say the balance of risk today is that interest rates will be higher as we go forward simply for the fact that they've been at historical lows for a pretty long period of time. Uh, but 4% is the, is the number that we used. And, and that number was developed with some outside uh, recommendations and advice. That was not just a, a staff-derived number. So I think we're, I have all these questions that we haven't answered. I'm sorry if we haven't gotten to yours. One of the things we're going to do after this meeting is a big FAQ that will be available on the website and we'll answer all these questions in addition to ones that people have written and posted around the room. 
So I think we are ready for our facilitators to come in for a quick report out. When they're done, we will essentially be done, although I have one more task for you, if you choose to do it. On this piece of paper is just a little reflection, and I think we've lost a few people from the beginning. But this says, today I learned something that you might do in fourth grade if you're doing a reflection on your project. Today I learned, whatever, I have these questions. If I have a preferred option, it is because. So if you'd like to fill this out, we'll be happy to pass them around. And I think we're ready for our first group to come out and do their report out. Oh, and Ms. Hart, you gonna say something? Help pass this out. Oh, thank you. So Letty Hardy is gonna help pass them out to people. Yeah. All right, so I'll do the end of the meeting housekeeping while we're waiting for them. When you leave, just leave everything on your table. We'll come around and collect the pens and the papers and gather them up. And um, I thank you all for coming. I hope you learned something, and I'm sure that we have learned something from you. If your questions weren't answered, feel free to reach out to city council and school board members with any of your opinions. You know you can email all of us. Uh, and here's our first report out person. Thank you, Tim Stevens. I was the facilitator for the two-phased uh, approach. And I must say we did uh, a very poor job because very, virtually no one liked the uh, concept of approaching uh, this issue from a two-phased approach. Um, there were a lot of risks that were identified, interest rate risk. This approach required uh, build out for a portion of the school, take a break. And at that point, a lot of people were concerned about, well, how do we know what interest rates are going to be when we have to take that pause and, uh, and consider what to do next? A lot of people were concerned with the looks of the school uh, from the standpoint of if you build a phase one and you're not able for a, a number of reasons not to build the second phase of the school, you're going to have a half-built school for the new portion still interacting with a, uh, an older school that's been patched up. So people were very concerned about that. Um, it could lead to a lot of people wanting to leave uh, Falls Church because of an, an extended construction period of time. People would just lose patience and not view Falls Church uh, in a favorable way for their, uh, for their kids. Uh, less use of the commercial space because only six acres was thought to be available under this two-phased approach as opposed to the 10 acres that would be available under a, uh, a build all new at once. Uh, the concerns about construction disruption. Uh, since this two-phased approach required an extensive number of years to, to, uh, to build out the school, there'd be a lot more years where there'd be noise and dust and uh, people felt that that would make it difficult to attract teachers uh, the quality of life in general, not only for the students, but for the teachers and everyone else would, uh, would be uh, at risk. Um, and then uh, finally, there was concern that uh, since the commercial areas would be available only in uh, portions at a time, that it would balkanize uh, what would otherwise be 10 acres available all at once. And so the concern was that we would not be able to get effective use of the uh, commercial approach under a two-phased approach. So those were the highlights. <coughs> and next we're going to hear from the renovate, Minimal Renovation Addition Group. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, my name is Virgil Parker. I'm going to be here to talk to you about the Minimal Renovation, uh, which was one of the first options. For those of you who are in our conversation, first of all, thank you. As a college student, hearing a lot of your thoughts and how passionate you guys are about this is critically, critically important. So there are very few pros. Um, I want to talk to you about some of them. Um, not selling off city property is important here. Uh, make sure that we sustain the value of the community, especially with our education system. Um, shutting off the building is definitely second. Reducing costs as well as conserving the development that we already have in the community. Um, as, far, as far as some of the uh, cons, the layout uh, with this particular project was very unusual. People thought, you know, generally that $65 million was not going to cover the full need of the project. So um, we don't want to end up doing something and then 25 years later readdressing the issue. Um, <clears throat> Renovation, therefore, would not be effective if we cannot have a proper uh, expansion based off the budget that is proposed. Um, you want to think about other options. Some people suggested that maybe we, we may be able to put off for about five years to reduce the debt and then to readdress the issue in a more uh, fiscally conservative way. Um, you want to also consider what is the return on the value we have as far as our students, 
parents, you know, millennials and people who may be, be able to congregate into the community, you know, that is critically, critically important since you guys are very, a very successful um, educational system, how can we continue that progress? And then the other uh, few values that people uh, spewed out at us is how do people um, reduce the quality or maintain the quality of education, excuse me, and also the character of the community has to be taken into consideration. So thank you for your thoughts. All right, now we're going to hear from the Build New Group. Okay, so some pros of the Build New option. Um, the full economic development potential um, is available with this option. Um, no more money going into a deteriorating facility. Um, the cost of this option is almost the same as a full renovation, um, which would be $100 million versus $117 million um, for this all new facility. Another pro, um, potential early, early development of the site could attract more development to the city. Um, it's a good opportunity for good architecture and urban design at the West End Gateway. And um, another pro, a positive effect of less disruption during the construction phase. Some cons with this option, the loss of park and recreation space, uh, too much upfront cost and tax burden on citizens, um, the redistribution of athletic field space, um, some we got a comment that um, some don't want to, to develop the commercial space. Um, this is a loss of open space, financial risk to the city, um, delay in financial benefit to the city, um, highest upfront cost, environmental efficiency of new construction versus renovation. And then another con, um, consideration of current commercial vacancy um, when looking at the new commercial development. Thanks, Gary. And our last speaker, Jim Snyder, is just gonna wrap up the economic development session. Thank you very much, and thank you for those groups who worked with us on economic development, and also uh, Rick and Becky from Economic Development, Garrison Kitt were part of the group. So we're going to summarize for all those folks. Uh, I think generally there was support for economic development. Uh, there were certainly some people were concerned about selling any land, uh, but generally s more support than not. Concerns about fiscal impact, questions about that. Uh, how, how positive could it be? How good were the projections? A lot of interest in having community uses as a part of economic development, making sure that whatever economic development did occur, that it would be complementary and synergistic with the uh, school property. Uh, the potential for redevelopment of the West End was mentioned, that maybe that would be a way to uh, get additional revenue to support schools uh, and possibly not rely so much on development of this site. Lots of questions and interest about the UVA Virginia Tech property next door, uh, parking, could that be available? What's the real situation with that? Of course, as we know, that's in Fairfax County, uh, but the city has an ownership position. Uh, discussions about the wisdom of selling versus leasing land. Uh, the market, uh, big firms prefer commercial versus residential. Uh, mix of uses was mentioned, uh, trying to get a mix of uses that would be used by more than just uh, uh, the people living there, but it would be a draw for the city. Some interest in higher heights and greater FAR because of the potential that if there was going to be that kind of development, this would be a place for that to happen. And then some thoughts about whether or not this could serve as a way for a redevelopment of the West End generally. Some cautions about don't build too much too fast because market forces can change. On the other hand, don't miss the market. Um, so. Uh, a lot of interest in that. There was uh, some discussion about how many acres and discussion and interest in knowing more about the PPA process and the ULI TAP 
and is this the right 10 acres uh, and could it all be developed at one time. Also a lot of interest in knowing more about uh, the economic projections. We did talk about planning and zoning, what is presently zoned now, which is single family. Uh, and uh, the fact that uh, Fairfax still is in charge of the UVA Virginia Tech site. So I'd say generally a lot of interest and general enthusiasm for economic development. Some concern about selling any land at all that maybe we should develop more of the other parts of the city and keep this reserved for schools. And then if development occurred, a lot of interest in synergy and complementary uses and making sure we didn't get uses in such a development that would be not complementary or not uh, be something that you'd want your school children and your parents going through. Uh, we heard about performing arts, ice rinks, other kinds of uses that might be able to be used, done in the commercial area. So uh, a lot of good discussion. I want to thank everybody who participated. Thank you, Jim. Now, I didn't plan this, but remember I said that it kind of felt like a Rubik's Cube, like one piece falls into place and then the other one doesn't? Somebody solved my Rubik's Cube today. <laughs> I just noticed this. So thank you, Tim. So somehow I think we're getting close to an answer. And I really want to thank you all for spending your Saturday with us and for your continued involvement. And to so please continue to be involved. And we'll be back to you soon.